Welcome back to Reliable Sources. This week, finally, there was a truce. Fighting ended between Israel and Hamas militants. But the facts on the ground have not changed, nor have most people's opinions. Matty Friedman has covered Israel for nearly two decades, most recently for the Associated Press. And in an essay for the Jewish magazine Tablet this week, he posed this provocative question. Is there anything left to say about Israel and Gaza? He got me thinking about how the Israel story is framed. Friedman says there is a severe malfunction in the way that journalists portray the country. So I want to ask him what that is. He joins me now from Jerusalem. Matty, good morning, and thank you for joining me. Let me start with the truce this week. You wrote that you believe the events in Gaza this summer will not be remembered over time as being particularly important. Why is that? I think that if we look at what happened in Gaza this summer, apart from the tragic and senseless loss of life, we see another round in a war between Israel and the Arab world that's been going on for about a century. It wasn't the first round. It wasn't the first round against Hamas. It wasn't the first round in Gaza. And unfortunately, it won't be the last. So is that why you say instead of calling the conflict Israeli-Palestinian, it should be called in the press Israeli-Arab or Jewish-Arab? When you frame the conflict as Israel-Palestinian, you are saying that this conflict is taking place on a tiny slice of earth in which Jews are the majority, which constitutes about 0.2% of the Arab world. Now, but of course, the conflict between Jews and Arabs in this land has been going on for about a century. Uh, it started before the state of Israel existed. It started before Israel occupied the Palestinian territories of Gaza and the West Bank. It started before the word Palestinians was even in use. Uh, implicit in the framing of this conflict as Israel-Palestinian is the idea that if the Palestinian problem, the Palestinian predicament, um, is solved, the conflict will be over. But I don't think there's anyone sane and knowledgeable in this region who believes that to be true. So I think the framing uh, should be reinvestigated and, and changed to reflect what this mm. conflict really is. My, one of my takeaways from your essay was also that you feel that there's not there, there's a moral equivalency applied to the situation that's not really there. Am I taking that away correctly? Um, I think that there's a disproportionate focus on Israel. It's objectively disproportionate if you look at the staffing of big international news organizations. Yeah, that was like a really AP important or, point uh, I think you made, that there are so many journalists in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, uh, as compared to many other regions of conflict all around the world. It's a, it's a striking, the numbers are striking, um, and people I think are not aware of them. I'll just give you an example. When I started to work at the AP, there were more than 40 full-time news staffers AP news staffers covering Israel and the, and the Palestinians. That's about 12 million people, by the way. Um, it was far more than the AP had covering 1.3 billion people in China. It was more than the AP had covering all 50 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And most importantly, uh, to my mind, as someone who cares about this region, it was more staff than the AP had covering all of the countries where the Arab Spring uprisings eventually erupted. The and AP perhaps had, that's because uh, the AP is based in New York in the United States and, and America has a special relationship with Israel. But what is the net result of that staffing situation, you think? Uh, the net the net result is a uh, objectively disproportionate focus on a country that I think, uh, if you look at it with dispassionate eyes isn't all that important beyond the emotional connection that some people feel with it. The numbers in this conflict um, are absurdly small if you look at it vis-a-vis -vis the prominence that the conflict has. Last year, for example, 2013, the entire death toll in the Israel-Palestinian conflict, this conflict of great global significance, which is staffed more than almost any conflict uh, on earth by most international organizations, the death toll here was 42 people. 42 people, as I write in my essay, is the death toll every month in the city of Chicago. Uh, Jerusalem, which is renowned as a city of conflict, we're in Jerusalem right now, uh, Jerusalem was actually safer last year in terms of violent death than Portland, Oregon, which is one of the safest cities in America. The numbers here are very, very small when you compare them to almost anywhere else. Certainly Syria and Syria, nearly 200,000 people have died in three years. 200,000 people is 80,000 people more than had ever died in the Israel-Arab conflict in the last century. The treatment of this conflict, I think, is an obsession that skews the way we understand the world. And you suggest that it makes Israel appear as the bad guy, as the enemy, and, and Jews as well, as a result. 
Yes, the first part of the malfunction, as I call it, is the disproportionate staffing and the disproportionate focus. The second part is the content. Um, most international media organizations here ad adhere to a very um, strict script and the unanimity of opinion and thought among journalists here is quite striking. In this script, Israel is the aggressor and Palestinians are passive victims. You almost never see real analysis of the Palestinians as agents of their own fate, as adults, as people who are making decisions about how to act in the world. The Palestinians are um, passive victims of the party that people really care about, which is the Israelis. Matty Friedman, thanks for joining me. Thank you very much for having me.